prayer sermons we get in the passages, you know, kind of have a frame of mind. Um, you know, when we get to a passage, you know, some passages, you know, you're you're dealing with the hard, you know, hard passage or um, you know, it's hard to understand. It's okay. I got to make this. I got. I got Thank you. Um, so you know, I got to make sure to kind of get really deep in the in the weeds to really help you explain what, what's going on in the passage. Or um, sometimes you know, and uh, we're dealing with a, a, a very difficult topic, and so it's like, oh man, this is a hard one to deal with. A hard, hard thing I got to really deal with, and so it totally changes kind of how I frame it. Uh, but here in Romans eight. Man, I just tell you, after everything we're going through in Romans, every week I'm kind of in the same mindset coming to these sermons through chapter 8. And then this is, you know, Paul just after he's told us, you know, how you were right with God. You know, well, first, that we've all sinned before God, and no one is righteous. But how we can, can become right with, before God, that's through faith only. Okay, now we're right now what? How are we supposed to live? And he's been talking about that. Here, Romans 8 is like the big thing of you realize what God has done for you. Realize who you are. Live like it. So as I've been preparing these messages the last few weeks and this week as well, and next week, I feel like when, when, I'm, when I'm preparing these and when I'm here, like, I just want to like come on excited. Like, let's go! Let's go! Live, live! All right, you know, like, cheer you on, let's go! There's so much! You know, a few of you, know, if you're looking here, kick him to go, 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 Let's live our lives like it. Instead of living our lives as a mopey, I'm a mopey Christian, I'm a mopey. No! <laughs> so much more. <laughs> oh, and I hope, uh, of course, with all the other um, Romans 8 sermons on YouTube, so you miss those, I hope you go back. Man, Romans 8 is just so stinking good. It's so stinking good. And it's, it's just going to keep getting good. As we're here to Romans 8, we're up to verse 18 now. Uh, I just, man, I, if, I could, if I could go to each one of you, like, during the, it's, maybe I should. I like, give you a high five during the sermon. I'm like, do you realize what God has done for you? High five, man. Let's go. You know? Maybe I'll stand at the back door. I'll give high fives and go down the line. You know? <laughs> at the end, you're right. Live our lives like what God has done for us. It's truly amazing. Um, and oh, it's, it's been a pleasure coming through this chapter. And so let's get into it. Starting in verse 18. As I say, he's been talking to the first part of it, of how we are to live. Last week we talked about how we are sons of God and we're adopted sons of God we are heirs to the kingdom of God just as Christ is and like whoa those are some huge things to say about whoa mortal me but it's there <laughs> he's going to continue to go off go off of that and starting in verse 17 actually I'll go in verse 16 to link in with last week the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we might be also glorified in him. Now that statement there um, at the end of verse 17 is where Paul, Paul likes to, you know, he has a linking to the next topic he's going to talk about. Because he hasn't really talked about suffering yet, in verse in chapter eight, uh, and now also he throws in the suffering with him, and know that we also may be glorified with him. There's those two parts he's going to talk about here in chapter eight. First, he's actually going to talk about the glory that we might be glorified with him, and that's what we're going to talk about today. That's verses um, eighteen through um, uh, twenty-five. And then next week, we're going to pick it back up at 26 and talk about 
our suffering, provided if we suffer with him in our, in our weakness. We're going to talk about that next week. So today is all about the future hope we have as adopted sons. So I'm going to, I'm going to hit on again why sons is a key word. But we're adopted sons, and we have a future glory to be glorified with him. So let's see what he has for that, starting out in verse 18. So you've got your Bibles, make sure you're in Romans 8, starting in verse 18. Let me pray as everyone's getting to Romans 8, verse 18. Father, as we come to your word, we, well, I'm just so excited when we get passages like these that aren't condemning passages, you know, which is good to condemn, condemn sin and convicting, but this is a convicting passage that we live how you want us to live. Or live lives led by the Spirit. Live lives that understand who we are in you. So as we come to this another great passage that runs a Lord motivate us. But your spirit spur us to action Lord, because of what you have done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're starting at verse 18. And after just mentioning that we also be glorified with him. Verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and attain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So as we see here, he's talking about our future glory. And we see that when we look to our future glory, when, when, we, when we keep our eyes where they need to be on, on the future, he starts off right in verse 18, our present sufferings pale in comparison. This links it back up with verse 17. And this is the topic sentence for uh, this whole next passage and even passage we're going to talk about today. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And he's talking about the sufferings. And, and, and this is kind of an all inclusive term. Don't think it's like persecution, but just sufferings. Anything going wrong in today's world or in your life, any, anything that's going on pales. In comparison to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Christ coming again. Our new bodies that we will have. All this glory that is to be revealed. Everything going on in this present time. Pale in comparison to us. And remember what Paul has been through. Remember he, he lived a pretty good life early on. Raised in a, in a good pharisaical home. Great education, the leading persecutor of Christians. Uh, then, then God got all of them on the road to Damascus. He became a missionary for God, spreading the word. Now, what kind of sufferings had he gone up, done through to this point of writing this letter? Well, he had been, you know, falsely accused of many things. He'd been run out of town for preaching the gospel of Christ. He'd been. Uh, Jailed, been thrown in prison at Philippi. You've even been uh, stoned. <laughs> and for Paul to say all of that pales in comparison to what is coming. He reminds you that. Now I'm going to kind of keep building on that throughout this passage. I'm going to circle back around to it. But our present sufferings, they only hold, hold a candle. The glory that we have to come. 
Because now he gets more, you know, with the why it, it pales in comparison. All right, in verse 19, and we're going to see here in this big section that we all anxiously await it. We all eagerly want it to come. Verse 19, for the creation waits with eager longing. <laughs> Why does creation work wait? Well, when we sinned with Adam, we were cursed. But what, what else was cursed? Yeah, creation was cursed, right? And so, now a key thing in this little section, he, he's going to, when he says creation eagerly awaits, he's not literally saying, you know, creation has a personality that is waiting. You know, he's, he's using a personification thing. So don't be thinking, okay, there's a Mother Earth that is anxiously waiting. No. Earth is just the creation, but he's using it to prove his point. Uh, and it's not only us, but creation, all of creation waits. And the Greek there is more of a eager, with, with, uh, waits with eager longing. It's a, an eagerly waiting. And, and that, that uh, Greek word is used seven times in the New Testament. And every single time, that eagerly waits is used in connection with Christ's return. So this is what creation is eagerly waiting for, Christ to come back. Christ's return, eagerly waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. This will happen when Christ comes back. Now, what in the world is he talking about there? Revealing of the sons of God? Is he talking about angels who? Don't, don't read it out of context. Because remember, just previously, like last week, we talked about who's been adopted as sons of God. We are, correct? So he's talking about the revealing of the sons of God. This is when uh, you know the, the the those who believe in God uh, will be revealed. It's just kind of pointing to um, uh, the resurrection of our bodies. It'll be plain <laughs> who. Loves God and who doesn't? That's what he's talking about. And that's going to happen when Christ comes back. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Now this is another question. So the creation was subjected to fertility, you know, not, not able to, to do anything. And, and once again, he's saying creation, not willingly. It's not like creation has a will. He's using the personification type of uh, literature technique here. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Now, there is a little bit of split among scholars of who that him is. Uh, one school of thought holds it's, it's Adam. It's, he's the one that sinned. It's because of Adam that they've been uh, subjected. Other one to him is, is God. Because remember in the Greek, there is no capital letters. So to him, we don't know if it's referring to God. I think it's referring to God. Because even though it was Adam that sinned, does Adam have the ability to subject the land? Do we have the ability to subject the land in our power? No. It's God who gave the curse. Who cursed the land because of our sin. So even though Adam caused it, it was God who subjected it to fertility. But did God subject it to fertility and just let it be? No, what's the last two words in verse 20? Subjected to infertility, futility in hope. In hope. God already had a plan. He was going to have to be, the land would be cursed, become futile. But in hope. That the creation itself will be set free from this bondage to corruption and attain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. It's just showing again. Creation itself will be set free. Creation itself will be redeemed when Christ comes again. Like we know, when Christ comes again and he establishes his thousand year reign, you know, Satan is, is, is uh, not banished like a fire, but he's bound, his influence. 
But the Sazen army will still be here on this earth. And while there will still be, you know, some, some death and stuff, it'll be better. It'll be a, a, a better life than we have now. But then at the end of that thousand year reign, we have the institution of the new heavens and new earth. Where there'll be no sin whatsoever. There'll be no death, no decay, no nothing like that. And that's when creation will no longer grow. Creation it will be set free from its bondage to corruption, to having death and, and disease in creation. And attain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And attain the redemption, the, the cleansing, the purification that we will also get. That's what it hopes for. It's eagerly awaiting it, anxiously awaits it. This whole, this whole thing I think of um, uh, this eagerly awaiting, uh, like, 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 like the night before your wedding, or, or even that morning of. I remember the night, the night before, I was just kind of in a daze. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I was just like, okay, you're getting married. Cool. And that morning, like literally a couple hours before, it, it, I was like, oh my goodness, I'm getting married. And I was a wreck. We got honest. But I, I was eagerly waiting, right? You couldn't wait for it. And that's that's kind of a great thing to think of because when Christ comes again, he is the groom and who is his bride according to all the imagery of the, of the New Testament? His church, yes, we are. So we should be anxious to be awaiting that night or that day, whatever it is, that Christ comes back and redeems his church. And with that, not only will the people be redeemed, but the land will be redeemed as well. Continuing on in verse 22. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Now it says, been groaning together, that doesn't include man or, or us yet. But when he picks us up in 20, verse 23. The whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth. Now, I can't say from personal experience, but I hear childbirth hurts. Um, I'm going I'm to take the women's uh, word on that, uh, and childbirth hurts. And they've been groaning together in the pain of childbirth until now. It's going to keep going. It's going to keep going until this happens. Verse 23, not only the creation, but we ourselves. This is now he... He inserts us into it. Who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we await eagerly. There's that same word, await eagerly. So we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Okay, what is he talking about there? Is this like Fruit of Loom door busters on Black Friday? Get the joke? Okay, never mind. Black Friday, the door busters, because you're the first people there in the store, and it's fruits of the Spirit, Fruit of the Loom. Okay. My joke was, was too much. Okay. Fruits of the Spirit. Won't laugh. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. Yeah. Oh. First fruits of the Spirit. Well, a better reading of this to understand it is actually to say to have the first fruits, first fruits, which is the Spirit. So in the Greek, it's actually saying that you have the first fruits, which is the Spirit. Not first fruits of the Spirit, but the first fruits, which is the Spirit. So we have the first fruits of salvation, and that is what? The Holy Spirit living in us, indwelling in us. Elsewhere, in Ephesians 1.14 uh, the, 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 the Spirit is called a, a, a deposit or a down payment guaranteeing our inheritance. And that's what he's talking about here. The, the, the first fruits uh, we, we was the, the first harvest, uh, the, the first offer to God in, in the temple system. Uh, the, first, the first harvest was a, was a foretaste. It was a, it was a promise of more to come. So the Holy Spirit is the first fruit, the, the first installment uh, of the promise that there is to be more to come, that there is many more blessings 
which will include me in God's presence forever. That's what that first fruits means. Who we have the first fruits, which is the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our lives. We wait eagerly for our adoption as sons. Now, I talked about this last week, and I'll mention it again briefly. Here, um, like the New Living, uh, some translations, you know, when, when there's a male term, like when Paul calls brothers, brethren, uh, some of the new translations will put brothers and sisters in there to make it more gender, and for the most part, I'm, I'm fine with that, um, to use that. But here, and I think in this passage, the New Living uh, trans, uh, translation uh, changes it to adoption as children. But I'd ask you to cross out that children. You can just put a pencil line through it and write in sons. Because that son is a key theological term that we are adopted as sons of God. Because who's the only right? So it was key that we're adopted as sons, eagerly awaiting this adoption as sons. And, and what will be this adoption that we're eagerly awaiting? And that's what he says, the redemption of our bodies. When we, when we get our resurrection, when we get our new bodies, when our bodies are redeemed. Now, if you're here last week, or you read last week's passage, you might be going, what's going on? Because I thought, here, go back to verse 15, we covered last week. He says, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. You have received the spirit of adoption as some for you cried before. So here he's talking about an adoption that has already happened. Now, Paul, just a few verses later, he's talking about an adoption that we're still waiting for. So he's showing there's two aspects to our adoption. The first adoption is that we used to receive the Spirit. This is the first fruits of our adoption is that we get the Spirit in us. Help us right now. The second is that we were still waiting. Kind of the, the second stage of that adoption is our redemption of our bodies. I kind of, I kind of I think of it like um, if you picture an orphanage with orphans, you know, living there. I don't know how many we actually have around today, like in America. But, you know, these are kids with no parents. You know, they just have, you know, you know they just live along with other kids. And then one day the headmaster comes up and tells one of the kids, guess what? You've been chosen. You have a family. Equally, you, know, you have a family that's going to come and, 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 and take you here. You know, well, but you, you got to wait. Now, what does that do for that orphan that has lived a life thinking that there's no one that loves me, I have no parents, and now he's like, oh, I got parents coming, I got parents, I've been chosen, I got parents coming, now what does that do? He helps them live right now, right? There's that a little hope being implanted in the orphan that now, oh, well now he can get around his days better as he scrubs the floors, learns, whatever it may be, that it helps that orphan. And that's kind of what Jesus, you know, Paul is referring to here. Is we have the Spirit <laughs> who indwells us and helps us hold on. But we're still here in this world. <laughs> we haven't received that second stage. Because in that orphanage, that adoption, that orphan has been told, you have parents coming to get you. Eventually, the parents will come and pick up that orphan and take them home. And that's what we are still eagerly awaiting God. That second stage for us is when our Father comes and takes us home. So there's two aspects to this adoption. We have, we're adopted now. We have the Spirit as proof of that. But we're still awaiting that second one. Eagerly awaiting, anxiously awaiting that second stage. And then we see our new bodies when we're with Christ together. We wait for it. Clear as mud. 
But we anxiously wait. There's so many good reasons to be anxiously awaiting it. And lastly, we hear it, it is our hope for right now. Looking to our future glory is our hope for right now. Looking to our future glory is what gets us through today. Hearing on in verse 24. For in this hope we were saved. What's this hope? The hope of the future adoption. Of that everything will come together. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. We anxiously await the future. We anxiously await what we have there. Now, in this hope, we were saved. Now, now it's not saying we were saved because we hoped. Uh, it's just this, our salvation, and once again, uh, our past tense here, our salvation, salvation was completed at the cross. When Jesus died, when Jesus paid the price for our sins and then rose again, that completed the work of salvation. And now it's the Spirit who comes in us and puts us into Christ. That's the first fruits. That's how we're saved, but in the hope that it's all been done. Now we hope that was now hope that is seen is not hope. That's kind of like, you know, saying you look outside and you see big stormy clouds coming and you say, oh, I hope it rains. It's like, you know what? Is that, is that really banking a lot on that hope? Because, you know, you can see it's not going to happen. We have to say, oh, we hope it rains. You know, that, but we, can, we can see it. Uh, we're not really banking a lot on it. We're not risking anything on it. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. We hope for what we do not see. And when was he referring to what we do not see? Our future. <laughs> We can't see the future redemption of our bodies. I mean, we see the facts of it in front of us, but we can't see it. But we hope in it. And we wait for it with patience. And remember, our hope, biblical hope, is, is, is not cultural hope that you hear. I hope this happens. Our hope is a hope because it will happen. Flip back to chapter 5. <laughs> Romans 5, right at the beginning of it. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. The hope that God has given us doesn't put us to shame, right? When you hope for something and it doesn't pan out, you feel shame, right? I hope the Broncos would at least be competitive against the Chiefs. And they put me to shame because they did it. They got demolished. But will God's hope ever put us to shame? Will God ever fail us? God's hope is a concrete foundation that we can anchor ourselves in. And that's why we can wait for it patiently. Even though we eagerly want it to happen, oh, I want it to happen, we still have to be patient. It's in God's time. That's all because of that future hope. When we aim at the future, when we keep that in our sights, it helps us get through today. He helps us get through today's problems and sufferings. As we go back to verse 18 where it says, but 
I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. So we can take any suffering you have. Imagine I have a bucket here in front of me. I want you to start putting sufferings into it. Physical pain. Emotional pain. Financial pain. <laughs> Whatever it may be. I mean, pile it on. You know, just start thinking of everything going wrong in your life and put it in that bucket. Now, so that aside metaphorically, think about, okay, what's all the hope that I have of what God has promised me? The glory that is to come. What hope do I have? Well, I got, I, I, you know, I got a lot of physical, but okay, God has promised us a new body. Okay. He's promised a, 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 a new body for a couple of years. No. Promised a new body last 10 years. A new body that will last 50 years. No. A new body that will last for eternity. Oh, I better start piling in that glory. I uh, have to do it for, for eternity to get it to match just that hope. <laughs> okay, now he's going to say that all relational sin, problems with family, problems with, with, with sin in our life is all going to be gone. Yep. Don't want to pile in more glory into that. Now do you see how our present sufferings that will last for a finite amount of time. And, and, and even if you've been you know, suffering and hurting for a hundred years. And, and our bucket of suffering is, is really a thimble compared to a 2,000 gallon tank of the glory to come. Which that 2,000 gallon tank can't even hold it either. It's got to be infinitely full of big to, to have all the glory we have to come. And we got to keep our minds focused on that. By doing, by, by reading his word. Because it, 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 what sin wants us to do is to get our eyes off the hope that we have in Christ. And the hope is the future hope. Again, it's just worrying about, oh, i got to get through today. Oh, my God, my checkbook just doesn't balance. Oh, no. Like, I'm so busy this week. i got so much fun. Oh, all these people that make me so mad at work. And, I mean, that, that, that's what sin wants us to focus on. But what does God want us to focus on? Yeah. Yeah. So I challenge you, what way to do this, and I have an amazing wife that prompted this, is when you have, you know, I, mean, I use physical pains, I know we got a lot of people around here that are dealing with physical pain. I encourage you to post verses around your house that remind you of the future hope you have. Take uh, 1 Corinthians 15. I tell you, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the imperishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all fall asleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable. We shall be changed. For this perishable body will put on the imperishable. This mortal body put on immortality. When the imperishable puts on the imperishable, the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass a saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. <laughs> death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Print that out on something and post it next to your bed. So as you turn over and you go, Oh, I gotta go to bed. Oh, hey. Oh, look at that hope I have. Okay. Yeah, Lord. Get the hope. And of course, this is how we gotta remind ourselves. Just paste God's word everywhere. We've been doing memory verses. and We have memory verses taped up in our cars and taped up in our bathrooms and stuff. So that we have it in front of us. To remind us of what God has for us. Plaster our lives with God's word. I encourage you to do that. And if you have an area you're struggling with, find verses and print them out. And plaster them on the, on the, on the walls. Put them on your mirrors in the morning as you're getting ready. You can... Be seen in the verses of hope, our future hope. We keep our eyes focused there. Because when things go wrong here, it's our focus down there. Get us through it. So I encourage you to do that. Because, man, our future glory is so much greater than anything we have today. 
our future glory. <laughs> that's, that's just amazing. And we wait for it. Oh, we want it to happen. But we gotta be patient because it's in God's time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the hope that gives us. Lord, as we go through our tough times here, we go through our our, our, our struggles and we go through our trials here, oh Lord, that we don't pull our eyes off of you. Lord, we, we don't pull our eyes off of you as the risen king. The risen king seated at the right hand of God and is waiting to come back and recapture his throne. Just waiting for the word from the Father to do so. Lord, as we look to that time, when Christ comes back in his glory and sets things right, let us that be our anchor of hope to get us through today. Everything we go through today. Everything that goes wrong. Everything that is delayed. It's not going right. It seems to all go into the plan, Lord. But you don't. Your plan will come. That is a hope we can anchor into. Lord, thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.